Welcome to this, the second of Renew's six Green Rebuild Toolkit webinars. Tonight's webinar is Designing and Building for Bushfire and Climate Resilience. We acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, water, and culture. We pay our respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. We encourage you to share in the chat the Aboriginal land from which you are joining us tonight. Also, we acknowledge that it's possible something you hear may be emotionally challenging for you. We encourage you to reach out, reach out for support if this occurs. One such resource available is Beyond Blue, they are available 24 seven and their number is 1-300-22-46-46. That's 1-300-22-46-46. Now to some housekeeping. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. There are a couple of webinar functions we encourage you to use tonight. The chat function is on the bottom left hand side of your screen simply click on the icon to use the chat. It would be great if you tested it by sharing with others where you are reaching us from. Next, the Q&A function is on the bottom right hand of your screen. Similarly, click on the icon to open the window, type in your question and press enter. You can also upvote questions by pressing the thumbs up icons. The Green Rebuild Toolkit is a project from Renew, a member-based nonprofit organization who have provided Australians with expert, independent advice on sustainability since 1980. Renew also publishes two leading sustainability magazines, Renew and Sanctuary. Through this work, Renew has worked directly with designers, architects, and sustainability experts for over 40 years. The devastating bushfires of 2019 and 2020 prompted Renew to share some of the expert resources that have been collected along the way. And so the Green Rebuild Toolkit project began. It is intended as a platform to share Renew's expertise, to amplify other projects and people doing good work in this space, and to share the stories of those rebuilding. The toolkit can be found online. It is divided into eight sections, that walk you through the process of rebuilding. You can read it chapter by chapter or jump to sections that interest you. Throughout it, you will find expert feature stories, buyer's guides, and case studies. There are also many links to external resources, which you can find in the blue boxes in the margins. Importantly, the toolkit is designed to grow and evolve. If you know of a project that you think should be included or would like to share your own rebuild story, please follow the, link, the links on the website. Now to tonight's program. We have three speakers tonight. They will each speak for between seven and 10 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A, responding to questions you have posed in the Q&A function on your screen. I'll now introduce myself and then our three panelists for the evening. I live in far Eastern Victoria in Malakuta, a remote coastal community profoundly impacted by the 2019-20 bushfires. I've volunteered for many years in efforts to grow community and regional resilience. I'm the coordinator of the Malakuta Sustainable Energy Group, a member of Friends of Malakuta and I present two weekly programs on 3MGB Wilderness Radio, radio our little volunteer community radio, radio station. The first is From Little Things, where I celebrate the little things that happen in our community and in the outside world. The second is Healthy Conversations, where I chat with the local doctor. I also run Carbathon Consulting, a small practice where my focus is nurturing resilience, helping individuals, organizations, and communities create sustaining futures. I particularly like helping others develop their skills for living responsibly and responsibly. Remarkably, since my husband and I moved to Malakuta 11 years ago from North Warrandyte, 
in the bushy northeast of Melbourne. Our daughter, her husband and two youngsters, and our son have also moved here. We were all here on New Year's Eve 2019. We chose to defend our daughter's property and to pre prepare the other two as best we could and leave them to whatever occurred. The fires came very, very close to both of our homes, but in no small part due to neighbors and emergency services, our properties were not lost and the defense of our daughter's home was also successful. 123 other families in this town of about 650 families were not so fortunate. Our town has established a community-led recovery association and COVID willing, our plans for recovery are continuing to emerge. And now to our speakers. Our first speaker is Dick Clark. Dick is principal of Envirotecture and is an accredited building designer with 40 years experience, focusing exclusively on ecologically sustainable and culturally appropriate buildings and has received many design awards. He is director of sustainability and past president of the New South Wales chapter of BDAA. He is a past president and board member of the Association of Building Sustainability Assessors. He has designed hundreds of projects with sustainability as a major focus, considering an ever-changing understanding of what sustainability is, covering a wide variety of projects. Dick has contributed to the Your Home series and edited How to Rethink Building Materials. Next, we will hear from Nigel Bell. Nigel is principal of Eco Design Architects, working from the bushfire prone Blue Mountains, New South Wales. He has been involved over the last 20 years in bushfire education, writing, and presentations, with over 30 years as a leading architectural practitioner in balancing sustainability and bushfire requirements. Nigel facilitated community bushfire recovery through 2009 following the Victorian bushfires, 2013 in the lower Blue Mountains, plus extensively through the wider fire, fire grounds in 2020. He has represented the Australian Institute of Architects on the three Australian bushfire standards and as an expert, expert witness to the 2020 Royal Commission. Our final speaker for the evening will be Julie De Jong. Julie is a director of H and H Architects, which is the largest regional architectural practice in Western Australia, and has three permanent offices located in Albany, Bunbury, and Kalgoorlie. She works on a range of residential, commercial, government, and community projects, combining her interest in sustainable design principles with practical design outcomes. Julie also brings to the practice specialist heritage planning and conservation knowledge, as well as being a level one BPAD qualified bushfire practitioner. Julie is passionate about the role of architects to contribute positively to community development and serves on a number of community boards and forums focused around social justice, homelessness, bushfire resilience and education. Now, just a reminder that all presentations will run first and then we will have a Q&A discussion with the panel members. So now to our first speaker, Dick Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Tisha, and good evening to everybody. I'm going to run through an analysis of a property that was lost in the Gospers Mountain fire, uh, the single largest fire in by area that uh, we've ever seen and, uh, and a particularly difficult one to get under control for all concerned. That was the property that we uh, designed and built in 2003 for, which was uh, compliant with the building, the Australian standard 3959 as it was at the time. And uh, just to get this going, and that is what we found uh, a couple of days after the fire went through. And you can see from that that certain materials in that building have uh, withstood the fire reasonably well, considering, uh, and others have just failed completely. But also looking at the surrounding bush, you can see spots of green. 
and, uh, and, and, and on the grass, this is at the end of a very, very dry period. Um, so uh, there, there are clues there that when we went back forensically to try and figure out what had actually happened and why the building had burnt down, we, uh, we started going through those. So the, the construction was basically, uh, the shed on the left was on a, a, mostly on a slab part of it. Immediately on the left there was a raised timber floor and the cottage on the right was on a slab, but surrounded by a timber deck, um, which is all black butt, black butt and iron bark. And it was detailed to be compliant with the standard, the old standard as it then was. The poles are uh, iron bark and the beams are iron bark. So uh, we went for the most resilient timber we could find and it was all sourced locally uh, in the uh, Wadigan Lower Hunter area at the time. Construction of the, um, the materials there, uh, the wall frames and so on was already out of pine. Um, there's some bloke hanging off a wall frame there who was young and fit enough back in those days to put on a nail bag and, and help with the construction. So I know intimately how this thing went together. Um, for quite a while, the, uh, the cottage wasn't built and it just had a kind of a barbecue shed over the top. And, and that was the interior. Um, of the cottage at the time. Um, that, not take, that photo not taken in a drought year, obviously, and this is uh, in the southern Hunter Valley, the very northern edge of the Wadigan Plateau, and uh, it's nestled up against the hills there, and um, it's, it's a beautiful location, but then, of course, that happened and away we went. So this is what we found. Uh, one of the clues is that the grass, such as it is, did not burn completely. And the path of the fire was from the right of this photo, the west, the west and northwest, coming up the little valley and down from the ridge on that side. Now, the construction was, as I said, uh, the hardwood poles in iron bark holding up beams that were holding up. Uh, what used to be called a Ritec roof is now, the brand is now called Arc Panel, and it was one of their older products with EPS foam core. And uh, you can see what's left. There are two skins of corrugated iron with this EPS core between them. Makes terrific spanning and insulation, but is basically just sort of a, a solidified fuel waiting to go up once a spark gets into it. Um, but the iron bark has charred, uh, the beams being horizontal had burned, the poles being vertical, uh, interestingly had not. The foreground here is the remains of the plastic water tanks, which were pretty much full. It had 72,000 litres of water and they were pretty much full. Now, an important factor here is that the building was unattended. This was essentially a weekender and uh, ironically, the owners of this who are very close friends of mine were at our Christmas party, which was held on the night and we were watching fires near me on the RFS app and basically uh, saying, well, it's either survived or it hasn't. And uh, that is the remains of window glass. Uh, looking under the roof there. Um, on the right of that photo, you can see the slow combustion heater, uh, nicknamed Nancy in our world because it was uh, the product was called a Nancy from Eurofires and it survived and it's actually going back into the rebuild. I'll talk about that tomorrow night. Uh, it had a coat of paint on its top cover and a new flue, but otherwise um, escaped completely unscathed, which is just amazing, especially when you consider the tractor uh, melted. And you can see the remnants of some beams there that um, uh, being iron bark had also resisted burning, but had burned away to uh, sufficient to cause structural failure. That is uh, aluminium. That is the remains of some window frames running out across the ground. So it tells you something about the temperature of the fire that it's enough to soften glass and to melt aluminium and, uh, and basically cause it to run away. And what we're looking at here is down the core of this SIP roof, the, the old Ritec uh, roofing sheets or panels, I should say. Those vertical things are the long screws that go through to connect it to the top plate. And we suspected that this was a, uh, uh, a cause of 
um, fire ignition. That's the uh, remnants of the tanks. When the tanks melted, the water ran away. And in spite of 72,000 litres of water running across the site, the tanks still burned up and melted away. So how did it ignite? We think it was ember attack. So you can see here, this is literally days afterwards and you can still see uh, bare ground that has not been burned. So we don't think it was the approaching grass fire. We're pretty sure that it was embers. And there were therefore two points that the embers could have uh, landed on to cause ignition. The deck is an obvious one. Now, in spite of the fact that it was a, uh, one of the sacred species of bushfire resistant hardwoods, uh, resistant being the operative term, not bushfire proof. So that's an obvious point where enough embers would have caused ignition and with nobody there to manage the building on the day that uh, would have uh, ultimately caused um, some sort of connection through to the frame. But was it the initial point of ignition? That is not what, uh, that's what's less certain. So this is uh, under the deck or it was the deck. And so clearly the deck, you know, has, has burned right away at some point. However, there's another possibility, and that is that in spite of the ember proofing, that there may have been one or two little points where embers did get in, into the SIP roof, in, in, into the expanded polystyrene, which is not fireproof. And, and this is an important point when we think about materials, is uh, that EPS, expanded polystyrene, is basically a, a fire time bomb, no matter what product it's in. And it also has lots of other issues. We've actually banned it in our practice and we're trying to get it banned uh, universally, not just in the building industry, but universally. And there's a bit of a movement for, to, to see that happen. However, it just needed to get into one point and that would have been it. So it could have got through the fascia, it could have got under a barge, probably less likely, it could have got through the ridge. So I think um, the ridge is probably uh, a suspect point because if the ember proofing had deteriorated at any point there that would have uh, allowed that to get in there and, and go and the reason we think this is possible is looking at the the back wall of the shed so this is the on the left hand side um, that is the the cladding which is peeled down and uh, and the the wall frame the radiata pine uh, wall frame inside has just burned away and the fact that it peeled down like that kind of indicates that it might have started burning from the top down rather than the bottom up. But, you know, it, it's a little bit uh, uncertain. We can't be sure. So there are two possibilities. And one of the things about the new standard, I guess, is that um, it, uh, it, it tightens up a, a number of details that the old standard did not. I don't know, Nigel might have some more to say about that. So if the site had been attended, it's easy to extinguish the embers on the decks. That was, that's visible and at ground level or above it, you can, you can easily uh, wet that down. If it had occurred in the roof panels, it would have been much more difficult. It would have been hard to spot, much harder to extinguish. The height of the ridge on a two-storey shed and the angle of water from a hose yeah, very difficult. And climbing on the roof in an ember shower uh, with a, a water as well, downright dangerous. So there's a possibility that these buildings may have been unprotectable. Uh, that is actually quite uh, a disturbing possibility. But there you go. That is, uh, that is one of the issues that we might have to deal with. So um, I will stop sharing. And, uh, and I will now hand over to Nigel. Thank you for that, Dick. Just while I'm trying to call mine up, um, share screen and window. I think perhaps Dick might need to unshare. Oh. I'm sorry, I have to click stop sharing, my mistake. There you go, Nigel, it's all yours. Well, now I've got to share. Let's see if I can make it work too. Okay, so to call mine up, I need to 
hit control. Yes, there we go. But let's start from the beginning. Thank you. I trust you can all see and hear. This is about a project I was involved with a decade ago in Wiradjuri country, which is west of Blue Mountains and before Lisco, New South Wales. This is an area which is technically um, bushfire attack level 40 because the fire danger index was 80. Blue Mountains at 100, most of Victoria and central New South Wales at 100, but other states are less. So the bushfire attack level in other states, notably South Australia, Western Australia, Queensland and Northern Territory, their BAL40 is really um, a much lesser standard than what we have to face in the most bushfire prone areas. But I'm sure that's going to change. It's uh, a historical anomaly. So this were the owner builders that came to me because they'd seen uh, two designs I'd done in Mount Tomar. One design was down on the valley floor, which was a long circuitous route to get from the road to the valley floor through beautiful tall forest. My clients for that property said, yes, but getting out is a real problem. And I agreed. Less bushfire risk on the valley floor, but if they've got to zigzag at the last minute, that would be suicidal. So I did a design following normal protocols close to the road, but that was going to put them on the steepest part of the slope. They didn't proceed. And these good people thought about building and buying that land, but didn't, but were sharp enough to understand what the two differences were in design when they bought a different property entirely. And that's where I got involved. On the uh, top right, it shows the property a decade or 11 years ago, where it was in Dargan near Lisco. There is the one road in and out, never a good issue when you're in a bushfire prone area, and it had a steep western slope. Again, that's nine times out of 10, that's highly problematic. But one of the reasons they bought it, there was already an approval for a Bal 40 house, and there was already a concrete slab down on a um, northeast southwest access parallel to the road cut into the slope. That was helpful. Being cut in, low profile. They had, as you can see below, Hebel blocks, but they'd sat there for years and were crumbling away. So we decided we wouldn't use Hebel, although it's very fire resistant. They were too far gone, but we did use them in the landscaping. So the design challenge was how to actually do a house that is sustainable and highly bushfire resistant above a steep western slope. Average slope around 16%, nine degrees, with a few steeper drop-offs and a dam, unfortunately, right down the bottom, too far to be useful in an emergency. But the other point was how to actually use the slab because it was designed as a rectangle and the original design anticipated there'd be a fairly useless veranda all the way around, which of course cuts out your sunlight when you most needed it, quite apart from not being very sensible for bushfire. But the photographs on the left, the bigger one, shows what happened, unfortunately, on Christmas, sorry, New Year's Day, 2020. The fire, the Gospel Mountains fire, the same one that Dick was talking about, was very widespread. The 2013 local fire came shooting up the western slope and typical of the vagaries of fire, a wind shift turned it 90 degrees and the house, which at that stage was just an open timber frame, perfectly okay, purely by a wind change when it was only 100 meters away from the actual house. But the one a year and a half ago, that was deadly. It was substantial bushland, it had been burning for weeks, if not months. And when it came through, there was the dam at the bottom of the property. Here is the subject house that survived. All the other ones around about all went, except the one over the ridge on the eastern side. And certainly in the eastern states of Australia, to build on the western slope, which obviously is maximum exposure to drying sun and in many cases, the strongest winds, the most likely bushfire direction, 
that is going to be far more unsustainable for fire compared to on the more sheltered eastern side where so typically the fire, the fire brands may continue over the top and continue on if you're lucky. No guarantees on anything to do with bushfire because obviously they are very, very unpredictable. So in terms of the house planning, the house design, and this is largely unrecognized in regulations, unfortunately. In all states, virtually, we there are town planning documents which talk about the site, the slope, what you may and may not do. There is almost nothing about design because immediately it jumps onto Australian standard 3959, the most recent version being 2018. And that's about construction, materials, products and, and assemblies that are permitted. Design, there's always a design there, but that is too hard to regulate at this point of time. But certainly what Dick, myself and Julie is talking about is the development of a better understanding of how good bushfire resistant design can really help make your house more resilient and more sustainable. So with this one, if you look at the photograph, you can see the roof keeps going up and up and up, and that's to get windows facing north. They were meant to be bigger, owner builder played safe and made them smaller. The whole point though, is that in the Southern hemisphere, we want the predominance of window facing north because just by simple things, the degree of eave overhang, we can get the sun in when we need it. We can keep the sun out in the hottest part of the year. But if you look carefully at the profile in the drawings down below, two long sections, it had to be that section because I was using the existing slab. And the design challenge was how to keep the wet areas where the pipes are already there and how to actually configure rooms and roofs to suit the slab and be sensible to build for a, an experienced older uh, owner builder. So you can see that the roofs slope up at a regular spacing. But what we did was then in between have gently curved roofs, curved to minimize uh, gaps and cracks and not needing to have uh, flashings at the top. And they were wide. There weren't little narrow box gutters which capture all the burning firebrands. They were deliberately broad and were typically western winds. Any embers, leaves, burning firebrands would be blown away. A deliberate design intention along with obviously having the windows facing to the north. You can see how the building is cut in from below the road. This photograph is taken from the road. And if you look behind, you will see the fire came up the slope, burnt on each side, and it was protected in the small, fairly low flammability garden directly behind. This photograph was taken about six weeks after the fire and they had put, <laughs> they had put mulch down. I never suggest using any timber mulch in a bushfire prone area, use gravel or use other ways of doing it. Anyway, you can see the consciousness of dealing with fire, wind and sun, passive solar design. The other point, which is apparent only on the right hand side, I can't see it on my screen, I don't know if you can, is the living area all down the western side, there was deliberately a crim safe stainless steel mesh, which was one and a half or two and a half meters away from the glass. So it became, if you like, the, the sunroom and the weather protection from late afternoon sun, and also kept the heat away from the windows because crim safe although stainless steel product can reduce approximately half the radiant heat temperature just because of the stainless steel absorbing the heat and minimizes the amount of heat that then go through onto the glass. So again, a conscious design response to the particulars of that site. Just a few photographs of what was there and what survived from the fire. Top left, you can see all the trees on that slope all went. They all burnt. They were starting to come back six or eight weeks after the fire. You'll see there's two large 50,000 litre concrete water tanks. Fundamental problem. 
when they were installed, and I wasn't involved in the construction at all, they put the stalks fitting in the wrong end. They put them facing what became the fire front, and the firefighters had the frustration of knowing there was stored water, but they couldn't get access to it because they weren't going to put themselves in danger. So in these situations, always make sure you can get access to the water from a sheltered location because the radiant heat is what will keep you away from getting to the water, but it doesn't take much radiant heat for you or me unprotected to, well, suffer and then die very quickly if we don't have full proper fire protection. So look at where your water supply is. Here it was to shield the house and it did that very effectively. The other point is top right, you can see how we used the Hebel blocks as part of the garden, the terracing. You can see the discoloration and that came from all the low planting that burnt, but it was contained largely by the Hebel blocks. It was very effective. The fire when it came through came all the way up basically parted around the house because of the water tanks, because of the low flammability garden. You can see bottom left how they replanted with new lawn. There was nothing close to the house that could burn. So the fire went around, went over the top and continued on. You can see bottom left how the screening protects a lot of the glass in the living area as well as giving the afternoon sun protection. You can see everything is very tight fitting. Two millimeter maximum gap is what the Australian standard permits. You can also see that everything is non-combustible. Where it came to the um, uh, corrugated metal, that is over nine millimeter autoclave fiber cement. If I was doing it now, I'd probably use magnesium oxide board. So we had several layers. The, the fiber cement on standard timber frame was gave good protection and fully sealed. The metal color bond was there for aesthetics and for longevity, no maintenance, particularly up high. The wall cladding you can see was a, a product called Timber Crete, now called Natural Stone. And that was a reconstituted sustainable product about 90 millimeter thick that was fixed in panel form to the wall lining. And in, you can get it in 190 millimeter, almost breeze block style. And that has a full four hours fire resistant. FRL 240, 240, 240, as great as you can get. But interestingly, when it comes to regulations, one of the inhibitions to doing things differently, we weren't allowed to put on the 90 mil, even though 90 compared to 190, you'd imagine it can deal, give you 30 minutes fire protection but it hadn't been fire tested in that thickness. So we weren't allowed to run just with that alone, hence the extra lining. One of those great frustrations when you're trying to do something different and better, unless you've got a spare 50 or 100,000 to do repeat fire tests, these things often cannot get approval. Just to finally, this was the rear of it, the shielded side and the owners had vacated some days earlier. They decided they weren't going to try and be bushfire heroes, that they would go to a safer place knowing the fire was coming in their direction. But when the Rural Fire Service volunteers came down that road, they realized this house had all the right ingredients and they could also shelter behind from the radiant heat, the flame and the smoke. So of all the houses in that street, this is the one where they concentrated the effort because they knew it was saveable and it was safer for them than most of the other standard brick veneer type houses in the surrounding area. At the end of the day, this was the only house within three or 400 meters that survived. There was another probably eight or 10 that were lost and another 10 or 15 along the length of the road. There was only a few that survived that particular intense fire coming from the northwest part of Gosper Mountains. So owner build a house, closely, closely built, no gaps, no, no uh, cracks, close to the ground, an interesting roof form, dealing with design response to fire and also sustainability. So there we go. Here's one. And now Julie, in a moment, is going to tell you about others. Thank you. Questions when you're ready.
Hi, everyone. I think you're still on, Nigel, if you can turn your video off. So I'm joining everyone today from um, Manang Noongar land in Albany in Western Australia. Um, I am a architect and also a bushfire practitioner. And today I'm just sharing an example of a project that we did approximately four years ago. Um, it's in the lowlands area. Um, I'm just going to share the screen with you at the moment. Uh, so it was a perfect, terrible example of the kinds of projects that we sometimes get through the door uh, of a bush shack built from found materials over a number of decades. You can see an example of the house there. Uh, it was located uphill, surrounded on every single side by a steep slope with bushland below. Uh, the bushland in this part of Western Australia consists of uh, what in AS3959 we determined to be uh, sort of dense woodland and shrubland and scrubland, plus we had um, grass uh, and in the vicinity of the building. As you can see, it was a, a single storey structure, timber framed with um, old fibre cement cladding. You can also see the timber framed windows uh, that were um, recycled from another location, the PVC um, downpipes, the very poor eaves lining or lack of eaves lining at the soffit um, and a fully exposed uh, subfloor. Let's go to the next slide. This is some other photos of the house on the day that we arrived. Um, so as you can see, doesn't have a lot in the way of um, uh, materials uh, that are really going to contribute to survivability in a bushfire. The clients came to us um, with their main brief actually being to improve the survivability of this structure. They did not want to alter um, the building footprint. They didn't want to do any extensions. They wanted to do a minor interior refurbishment, but the main design brief was actually to improve survivability of this house in the case of a bushfire. They had previously uh, lived through a bushfire. Um, as we know, and as um, Dick and Nigel have already pointed out, survivability is um, related to a number of factors. So some of them relate to site planning and careful placement of buildings. This one is an example of sort of the worst case scenario of where the house is located in relation to the bushfire hazard, as well as where the fire fronts are likely to come from, which was in every direction. Um, particularly in our area, we can have um, southwesterly winds in summer that can drive a fire front, as well as those from the northeast. And in both directions, we had a significant and ongoing um, extents of high hazard um, vegetation, as well as slope. Um, so the slope on this was up to 12 to 16 degrees um, in the vegetation um, downslope from the house. The other things you can see that, um, you know, would really contribute to this building probably being very vulnerable in a fire is that exposed subfloor, particularly as there's a whole heap of materials that are stored underneath the subfloor um, that could contribute a fuel load. Um, there had not been um, much uh, site maintenance over the last few years on this site. So I actually visited the property three times in order to do the bell assessment so that we could have a sufficient reduction in um, fuel loads and achieve better vegetation separation. Um, the next slide is the end result after we did the refurbishment of the exterior. This uh, demonstrate some of the things that uh, Nigel was just talking about in terms of non-combustible materials becoming the main um, cladding. So underneath there was still some of the old fibre cement, um, but it was very poor quality and had a lot of gaps. Obviously gap closure is a key um, feature for preventing ember attack, uh, as well as in this case, enclosing the subfloor. 
there were some challenges for those of you who are designers or architects that you will know of in the construction code is when we have subfloors, we actually do need to ventilate them. Um, and so what you can see to the perimeter here was uh, the challenge of introducing ventilation, um, but also screening it from ember attack. Um, we also needed to have some access to that subfloor, which required uh, consideration with the fire resistance of that access door. You can see there um, that we closed up the eaves. Um, in particular, the building was re-roofed. Um, so we ended up being able to get um, a compliant uh, solution in the roof with regard to getting um, fire rated insulation at the ridge and eaves line um, and produce, uh, reducing that scenario um, that Dick talked about at the start with embers entering into the roof space um, and causing ignition. Um, some other key areas that we had to address was around the windows. So obviously, we had to replace a large number of the windows, uh, which allowed us to relocate them for better solar access and views, because um, they were just sort of being haphazardly installed over the years. Um, we also managed, as you can see, there are some examples of the bushfire shutters that were installed over top of the windows. So. The site where it's located, it is highly unlikely that in a bushfire event, the volunteer fire brigade would be able to attend. Um, they were very conscious of that. So their strategy was that they were going to leave if they could, um, but there was not going to be any um, likelihood that uh, the brigade could get there. It was a one-way road um, on a dirt track, a long way from town. Um, covered on all sides by um, deep vegetation. So that was why creating that um, low fuel zone, um, that what we call the asset protection zone around the building was so important um, and has been a sort of an ongoing um, task for the clients to maintain. Um, and I guess improving the resilience of the outer shell um, to withstand both the radiant heat attack um, as well as the ember attacks that might be possible in a bushfire event. Um, there's some examples there and details that you can see um, of the kind of detailing we needed to have in the junctions to achieve those maximum two millimetre gaps um, between windows and walls, as well as the subfloor and where the wall came down to the subfloor and the, the ceiling up that was required with that corrugated roof sheeting uh, cladding that they wanted. This example down here was an interesting one that is um, a gap in AS3959. That's actually a enclosure we created for a composting toilet. Uh, so this house is off grid um, in terms of water and septic and they wanted a composting toilet. Obviously with a, a composting toilet being a dry system um, with a large amount of exposed pipework at the back where um, the, the service area is, it was potentially uh, an area for ingress in the case of a fire should um, the material fail either through melting or, or catching fire. So we had to create a ventilated um, but non-combustible enclosure for the composting toilet enclosure. Um, and then the other thing that we had to do is on the, if you recall on the earlier slide, there was a, a veranda on the, the back face of the house facing north. Um, and the clients were very concerned about um, protecting the windows and the doors that opened out onto that, um, that area. So basically the, um, the proposal was that we create a large habitable um, veranda space that was protected by bushfire shutters. Um, what that did that you can see in those examples there is actually created quite a wonderful um, ancillary space that also had the benefit of providing insect protection. Uh, this is called lowlands because there's quite a lot of swampy country uh, nearby so we can often have um, mosquito infestations. So they had the, um, the added advantage, I guess, of what those bushfire shutters brought to the project, as well as the ability for additional security. So it was intended to be a weekender. So it allowed them to lock up the house um, and know that it was secure, both from bushfire and from um, unwanted visitors, particularly in this remote area. Um, and this gives you a good idea of sort of that, how we dealt with that um, subfloor treatment and the ventilation and then improving that whole 
uh, roof um, and giving additional protection uh, for the case of radiant heat um, with protection of the windows through shutters and protection of the verandas, um, as well as um, ember attack through improving obviously the whole outer shell. Um, and so inside there is still that old timber frame bush shack with, um, with all its original features inside. It just looks um, a lot more different inside. Um, so that I think was my last slide. Um, so hopefully that gives everyone a good idea of uh, sort of a different approach, I guess, when you don't get to start from scratch and, and address all those normal things that we're looking at with good bushfire design in terms of site planning, um, addressing the vegetation and, and separation distances. So we had an existing house that we couldn't change its location. Um, and thinking about creatively how we could improve its survivability in a bushfire in case the clients got stuck there um, and in case the, um, the bushfire brigade could not get out there. Um, so, uh, yeah, hopefully that um, gives a good example and, and everyone um, has heaps of questions for us now. I'll hand over back to you, Tricia. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, Dick, and Nigel. My goodness, what, what stories. Um, <clears throat> we've got a few questions here. And if anyone um, listening has questions that they want to, want to put into the Q&A, please go ahead and, and do so. Um, the first question we've got, Raphael has, has a couple of questions here. Um, if you had to choose, and I'm not sure who, I think to all three of you, if you had to choose a site for a weekender or cabin in the bush, what are you looking for and what would you avoid to minimize bushfire risks? Well, isn't that the... <laughs> not the one I just showed you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start there. Was, yeah. Not at the top of the hill surrounded by extreme bushfire hazard. Um, so, you know, that one didn't um, have a lot of the main features that we would normally look for, which is um, sites that might already have some natural clearing. So the, the challenge for that project was we actually had to do quite a lot of vegetation reduction and modification. Um, to minimise the, the hazard in relation to the house and achieve some of those separation distances and also reduce the fuel load. So that wasn't ideal. They did have a massive property and it, it probably had a minimal impact, but on a sand dune like that, that vegetation is actually really important for stabilisation and habitat and all of those sorts of things. So there are always impacts if you have a site like that that's not well um, considered for bushfire. Right. Um, Dick or yeah, Nigel? Hmm. I would make the point that be very wary when there's only one way in and out. Always look at a, a, an exit strategy, as well as having your bushfire safety plan, and look at a way that, depending where the most likely fire direction is, that you have an alternative way to escape. Apart from that, obviously some states and territories more than others support, some don't support, bushfire shelters last resort, usually underground, built in. Um, so if you can't get out, more people have been dying from last minute trying to escape under impossible circumstance than previously. It's, it's a big issue. Australian Bushfire Building Council suggested 2.2 million people uh, are living in a higher extreme bushfire prone areas. I suggested the Royal Commission on those figures and others, up to a million houses Australia-wide could be in high or extreme bushfire prone areas. So there's a future seminar, webinar in a week's time about retrofitting existing houses. And obviously that's the sort of thing we need to do. And the last point I would make, not recognized by uh, regulators, is the benefit of bushfire water spray systems, sprinklers. The current Australian standard on sprinklers I've been part of, I've been pushing to get it totally re revisited and rewritten because there's new key research as well as anecdotal evidence of even simple things of the way a water spray system, particularly if you're in an isolated environment, can make the world of difference to survival, both for you and your property. Yeah, so I'd second that. Um, there's uh, another property not far from that one I just uh, talked about tonight that looked a lot like, looks a lot like the one that Julie had to deal with. And hats off to you, Julie. That was a, 
that was a high level of difficulty to get that one sorted out. <laughs> but this other property um, further up the hill um, was even more isolated and uh, and was also built from found materials um, by a landscaper who just you know threw it together on weekends and it's his little retreat. But he put a sprinkler on the roof and he's got a dam and he just set it to run. And when he was forced to evacuate. He, uh, he let it run and, and it ran until his generator ran out of petrol. And uh, if you look at the aerial photos from the time, uh, his house, his little cottage has survived and it's just black all around. Uh, so, you know, lots of anecdotal evidence. But, but in answer to the question, there's another kind of approach to it that if, if, if you were to find, and this might be a little bit controversial, I don't know, if you were to find a little patch of land that you really loved and you wanted to be the steward of, I would be looking after it anyway. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to put a weekender on it. You could camp on it. You could have a camper van and, and you know, or a caravan that you can pull off or, you know, something. There are other ways of doing it. But, but if, if by not buying a particular uh, bush block, the likelihood is that somebody else would buy it and not look after it, then I would be saying buy it anyway and, and deal with, managing the risk in some other you know inventive way mm. that's that's an interesting thought so work work around it so that you uh you can protect yourself and and um protect the bush <laughs> yeah good uh let's the there's another question from uh nyan is it good to allow different bell ratings for the same dwelling may one level one no maybe one level difference is fine but is it good to have one elevation at bell 40 and the other at bell 19. is that possible if i can explain seeing i'm a member of that australian standard um no they always take the worst case uh bell rating and it will apply to three sides and in most states there is the the most sheltered side you're allowed one bell reduction one bell step reduction, not in New South Wales. The most recent version of the standard has also um, clarified the wording that when they're talking about shielding, because that is a term, it, there's a paragraph about it in Australian Standard 3959, the shielding does not, um, well, it must allow for flame licking over the roof or if you elevate it under the floor. So again, three sides have to completely meet the, the required bowel rating. One side in most character, most areas, you can get one step less. But that's, that's written into the National Construction Code BCA, AS 3959, 2018. Okay, thank you, Nigel. Any, uh, either of you that want to have anything? No, not for that one, okay. Um, Tim says, are mud rendered straw bale houses permitted in fire zones? Yep. Again, it depends which jurisdiction you're in and how rigorous they are in wanting test results to Australian standards. Mm -hmm. the, there are some in my region where they did the alternative solution method, which is permitted mm -hmm. under the building code because they argued that 90 millimeters of dense render over steel or other structural materials was commonly accepted as meeting the required fire rating. So what they did was to use straw bale and have multiple layers to meet 90 millimeters of dense render, in which case the substrate being straw, totally encapsulated, didn't mm -hmm. matter. So, yep, it was a hard road to go, it's yeah, in um, Western Australia, so we have no um, alternatives. So Western Australia requires compliance with AS3959. Um, and so, yeah, as um, Nigel said, I would always say to people, it's only if it's part of a tested system. So, you know, people, we have a lot of people in um, the region of Denmark and Western Australia who love straw bale, um, but ultimately because it doesn't achieve that thickness of the render, then, then it can't in those higher um, bell ratings. And, and that's just a West Australian thing is that we have no performance solutions accepted here. So it's surely, your jurisdiction. Yeah. It's surely, Julie, it's part of the National Construction Code. So theoretically, 
that yeah. should apply whether your local council wants to overrule yeah. it with a different ruling is a different matter but supposedly it's nationally yeah. available mm, yeah mm. We, we've got um, a straw bale uh, house under construction at the moment in a flame zone that's um, mm. just the straw bale is protected by the render uh, yeah. it's not load bearing straw bale it is uh, post and beam infill straw bale but I, I don't think that would have been the, the critical factor it was the render mm. yeah and is the render i'm assuming the 90 mil thick Yes, yeah, so multiple yeah. layers you would do. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 you can't do it in one layer. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah. obviously the standard of straw bale when people are building it themselves is they're just putting a, a thin render on the outside that doesn't meet that requirement. Sure. So. Well, well, no, I, we, we would normally see um, 40 mils of render on, on straw yeah. bale as a minimum, regardless, you know, if there's no bale rating. Yeah. Um, so from 40 to 90, you know, it's just Not numbers. <laughs> <laughs> more reinforcing, more. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just mass. Mm. Um, how, Melissa asks, how does this kind of bushfire protection go as far as passive solar and livable year round? Looks like a fabulously tough bushfire design, but is, <laughs> but it, is it as hot as Hades? And I think that would be to you, Julie, with uh, what you did. <laughs> well, fortunately for our climate down here, it's not that hot. So we're at 35 degrees south latitude um, and the climate zone down here is climate zone six. So actually we're in a climate where we're trying to heat, not cool. Um, and there's some funny anomalies that occur where in our climate um, often the things like dark coloured materials on the exterior actually improve our um, thermal performance according to the, the um, energy efficiency ratings, not um, make it worse. So um, right. that one is actually, it's actually quite good because the, the improvements were in insulation. So the building still doesn't have any thermal mass. So from that perspective, um, it's not ideal because um, we were not able to incorporate any thermal mass, but we were able to greatly improve thermal insulation. Um, in the external walls, the roof, as well as the windows, because we had up spec glazing. So ultimately, um, it's not as drafty anymore, which is a, a positive. So yeah, it, no, we don't have problems with places being hot. Most houses down here don't need air conditioning. Lovely. Um, Brian asks Julie, fire rated insulation to ridge and eaves, what product and detailing was used? <laughs> There's only a few um, that are available in WA. I won't name brands, um, but I'm happy to provide some details back to Renew that they can share um, on some of the materials we use. Cause I saw another query came up about the, the bushfire shutters. So we did have to get fire rated insulation um, at the ridge and, and eaves and there's not that many available that are non-combustible and a lot of the challenges I find for um, the average builder is understanding how vulnerable those two areas are when you've got a profiled roof sheet um, in terms of ember attack going in at the ridge and the eave um, and that's usually the area of non-compliance we see is that often you'll just see normal insulation popping out there um, and obviously it's really important because that's the entry area for embers um so yeah so you you are going to give renew some of the yeah yeah happy to do that yeah i mean it's a little bit difficult because west australia for bushfire materials we don't actually have as much variety or availability as you do over east um, i saw that because i went to the fire australia conference um, and every show, every place I went to, they said, oh, yeah, no, we don't have it in Western Australia. So we've got a much limited field. So I reckon if you Google it, you'll find a lot more. But what I do recommend is actually checking for verified testing. So um, it is a, a, you know, a bit of a minefield for the average consumer to find materials that actually meet the real testing requirements. Um, and AS3959 is very good at laying out what those testing requirements are in return, you know, um, in relation to flammability, which Nigel can talk about. Hmm. Here's one that uh, is in an area we haven't, oh, Nigel, did you want to say something there? Go I was ahead. just going to say that mineral wool, uh, rock wool is a common material used yeah. to finish off at those areas because it can withstand heat much better than fiberglass or uh, other insulated materials. Um, one key thing is the major brand, the major Australian brand um, of roofing material automatically, if you order 
the roof sheeting will get you the profile closer to mm. meet the profile of the, the metal roofing. And that's the one and only product, one, one and only manufacturer from Adelaide that actually has a bell rating on mm. the profile closer. A lot of the open cell um, polyethylene will burn readily. So that's mm. just a little thing, gaps and cracks, yep, seal it but make sure you have the one product I'm aware of, which actually has a tested fire rating to yeah. make sure you can't get burning embers into that area. Yeah, because a lot of them, if they're not robust, they actually pop out under wind pressure um, and open up gaps. Yep. Nick, yes. Um, yeah, and that leads very neatly onto Robert McLeish's question here yep. uh, about protecting eaves coming through ridge capping and, and the need for ventilation of mm. eaves, um, especially now that we're moving into the idea of uh, vented cavities under uh, roofing with uh, vapor permeable waterproof membranes held down by vented cavity battens and so on. Um, and, and I know that um, Nigel has been working with some other colleagues of ours that uh, have been figuring out details that solve condensation risk at the same time as being compliant with FZ and other details. And, mm. Uh, it is important to have uh, an ember-proof vented ridge and eaves detail and having the, um, the ember-proofing either profile cut or rolled from a, uh, a suitable metal mesh is the solution that we use there. Mm. Um, yeah, the there is one product on the market, but, but often we just, because of individual roof design, we, we have to actually get it um, custom made. Yeah, and I know from um, in our region, it's actually a, a common issue that we're facing um, is that that dew point is occurring in those highly insulated and sealed up roof yeah. spaces. And one of the slides I show in another presentation I've done before is all the condensation um, build up where they have sealed off um, exhaust fans that weren't designed to have um, mesh on them. So obviously it can affect the operation of standard materials uh, and standard equipment. So you often need to actually get some, some professional advice from a mechanical consultant um, before you just retrofit um, grills that can affect air intake and expel um, because you can end up with condensation occurring in your roof space um, and in your um, the exhaust pipes themselves. So I've got a whole heap of photos I've collected of that problem where builders ring me up and go, oh, it's all good to comply with bushfire, but now look what's happened. <laughs> so, yeah, it's yeah. a big problem. Is, we've, we've been dealing exact, with exactly the same yeah. issue. Um, right. So yeah. it's, the thing is, be careful what you that you fix one problem and create another yes. one or two. Yeah. Yep. That's it. Okay. It's a whole package, isn't it? Um, there's a, a question from a, a different angle here. Why don't Australians use more under earth structures? Underground, presumably, or <laughs> earth, earth coupled. Yeah. That's we, not necessarily. Yeah. That's yeah. Not Do you like to live above ground? ground. <laughs> <laughs> <In the bush. laughs> I mean, obviously, um, they were very popular 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, no, there's a whole number of them in my area. But you still have to get the windows and doors. You still need to get light and ventilation into back rooms. So they still have many of the same areas of potential vulnerability. So mm -hmm. perfectly good, do wonderful things about moderating temperature and climate, but they still will be vulnerable at gaps and cracks, windows and doors, or wherever you're trying to get light and ventilation in. So go for it if you want to, but you still need some protection. <laughs> yeah, that, what, what it does is it, uh, it reduces, typically, if you've just got one side exposed, uh, it reduces your risk of exposure in, in terms of area or quantification of area you know, to one side of the building, which you'll probably spend as much building the structure and everything else, <laughs> um, you know, solving that. But some sites really lend themselves to it. Um, okay. It's not a universal solution, but yeah, it's a good one. Okay. Um during the, Kate says, during the Canberra bushfires, CSIRO said garage doors were a weak point for embers. Has that design problem been solved? Mm. Yeah, there are, um, there are ember proof systems for some garage doors, not all. Um, some roller doors and panel lift doors have got ember proofing uh, that is now compliant. But the okay. key problem that's emerged certainly in my area in the last year is 
existing windows and sorry, existing roller doors in particular, because inevitably there's a gap where the roll goes in and around. And so it's one of those areas of uncertainty for building certifiers in my area who are insisting that the garage or any rooms behind the roller door or occasionally a panel lift door has to be entirely fire protected from the rest of the house, including a fire rated door out of the garage into the house. Wow. So again, mm -hmm. it's just one of these areas where it's not clear. Mm. So much depends which jurisdiction you're in and which building certifier you're dealing with. Right. That's uh, another reason to get good qualified um, architects and, and building uh, builders on the job, isn't it? It's, it's, but you still it's need to convince the certifier and that's not always an easy job. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Um, there's a lot on amber attacks and, and protection from embers, and, and it's it's come up in all three of your your dis, uh, discussions or your presentations. Um, generally, uh, some some key points for this is this may be getting into the um, the final session about uh, retrofitting, but um, embers. If you're going to be thinking about embers with a new build or with uh, with a a re you know, a renovation or a, a fire protection in an already built structure. Thoughts, um, where does one start in, in looking around the, a property? Well, I, I think the reason we're all talking about ember attack is because the statistics show that is the main factor responsible for house loss. Um, yes. And it's often in the time after the fire front has passed. And often there are factors that affect that bushfire. Um, action. So people can have maintained their, their asset protection zone and their property really well. And then you can have a fire event where you've got wind bro, um, blown debris flying ahead of the fire front that is on fire um, that's, that lands in that property and can gather up against the building or land in the, the gutters or re-entrant corners. Um, and if there is vulnerabilities already in that structure, so you might have vegetation close to the house that's not um, particularly bushfire resistant or it hasn't been well maintained and it's potentially a, a source of ignition or fuel, then that can undo a lot of those things that you've put into the house to protect the, the building. So there's lots of factors. I think AS3959 is really clear on this at the start is survivability of buildings is dependent on lots of factors and even building to that standard is no guarantee that the building will survive. Um, but what you're trying to do is minimise those risks. And I think Nigel talked about that a lot in terms of the building form and design to really make sure that you're thinking about where's that fire front likely to come from and, and how can the building be well designed to respond to that. So it might be that you don't have those re-entrant corners on that side where debris can gather up in the building and form fuel against the structure. Um, and it's to do with, you know, how can we manage um, where vegetation is in relation to the building? Because I certainly, I love like everyone else, I want to live in the, I live in the regions in a, in a house in a bushfire zone. Um, and I think it's just about finding that balance so that the, the building and your, your site are resistant to ember attack um, and improve your survivability. And can I just say the one problem is embers are known to travel many kilometers ahead or even to one side of the main fire front. Mm. And the figures show from research 80 to 90% of all house loss is from embers. Mm -hmm. Very few comparatively from radiant heat or flame. And mm. yet ironically, the regulations are based on radiant heat. Heat, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I think as well, it's interesting, like a lot of people don't understand about radiant heat as well. But even when you're talking about that lowest BAL level of 12.5, humans can't survive 12.5 kilowatts per square meter. So, you know, you need the house to survive in that fire for you to be inside the house and taking protection, even if it's in 12.5. And I think a lot of the time we, we get slack about saying that it's only about the FZ or the 40, that's where the real risk is, but people can't survive 12.5. So, you know, that's, it, it's why it's so important. So the last thing you want is your 12.5 house that's resilient to that radiant heat getting taken out by embers, you know? <laughs> so it's, you know, the, the, the radiant heat is, is one factor for human survivability, but ember attack 
is another factor. And I think um, Dick perfectly pointed out how important um, humans are in controlling ember attack and, and, and dousing out embers. Yeah, yeah. Which can only be done if you are there. So yeah, or you have a passive system as, as Nigel mentioned with the sprinkler. sprinkler. So yeah. that's not a, a deemed to satisfy solution under AS3959 at the moment. It's certainly not big in Western Australia because everyone sees it and goes, well, it's not even going to improve my um, bell rating or, or get me off on other things. So they don't do it. But obviously, as we see, there's lots of anecdotal evidence about how that improves survivability of structures due to ember attack. Um, there are a number of questions about cladding and um, about, uh, the exterior finishes. Um, I think Nigel, you mentioned about the hempcrete and, and that it had was breaking it had been around for a while. Does, have you, does that mean that you wouldn't include hempcrete in a new structure, new hempcrete in, new, in a new structure? And what other kinds of claddings uh, might you recommend any of you? Okay, so there's a whole, whole suite of cladding opportunities. Timbercrete is the one I mentioned, hempcrete is another. They all have differing fire resisting properties. The fundamental problem is are they tested and approved in whatever thickness uh, in your home jurisdiction? Uh, and as I said earlier, um, there's many great products there that aren't purely because the cost and difficulty of fire testing can easily be 50, 80, dollars $100,000 over a year or two as they keep working to, to meet all the fine detail of the test regime. So that said, um, really, it's only when you get up to flame zone that you have to start to really justify which Australian standard. There are the generic Australian standard for fire testing is Australian standard 1530.4. That's what it is. However, there is now two specialized ones for bushfire testing. 1530.8.1 is the testing to bowel 40. 1530.8.2 is testing for flame zone. And obviously there are far more onerous fire tests than is common. So as all speakers have mentioned today, depending what your bowel rating is, that, that is a minimum, you can always do better. But certainly when you get up to the high numbers, you will, most building certifiers want the physical evidence of a test report to say, yep, that material is quite okay for that relevant bowel. Mm. Yeah. We've done some, um, some work, fair bit, fair bit of work with hempcrete because uh, it's got so many wonderful characteristics for other reasons. Um, and when it comes to bushfire rating, we've got all sorts of test results. And it's exactly as Nigel said, um, it, it's difficult to, to get the local testing to the Australian standard. We've got all sorts of test results uh, from France and from the UK that are not accepted here, mm. um, that, you know, basically prove the same point, but because it's not done to that specific um, test method, you know, then they're, they're not automatically accepted. Some certifiers will read between the lines and go, oh, yeah, I can see this one gives a, a correlation and, and other certifiers just go, no, mate, it's mm. got to be 15, 30.8.2 or I'm not, not having it. Yeah, I've used hempcrete too on... Um sort of a corporation housing model, um, which was Bell 19, um, and it was quite straightforward um, for approvals just because it was in a, a lower barrier and it's performed very well from, you know, those sustainability um, objectives as well as bushfire. Mm. Right. Now, there are some questions here that are about uh, landscaping, and, I, and we have another webinar later on next week that is specifically about landscaping, so I'm not taking... There's so many questions coming that uh, I'll leave, leave those to others if that's okay with the speakers. Is that all right? I'm fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, someone, uh, Deb asks, what material do you suggest for rainwater tanks in bushfire zones, please? <laughs> Not plastic. <laughs> yeah. Well, you probably really, your, your water is an asset in your firefighting um, so you do really want to protect it. So, uh, you know, in some regions, we can't get concrete tanks. So we're always doing steel tanks with liners. Um, and as uh, Dick says, plastic is, does not perform well. 
Um, but you also want to protect your tank and make sure that um, the firefighting uh, cam locks are in an appropriate position and, you know, that you firefighters can find them, that you can find them, that you've got a reserve on your tank or you've got a separate reserve tank um, available. But, um, yeah, the access to water is critical, particularly in our regional areas where um, the brigades are relying on that. I had a look at um, a couple of properties down in the, the King Lake Steel Creek area in Victoria after the, uh, the Black Saturday fires in 2009. And uh, one of the, uh, that once again was at the end of a fairly dry period. <clears throat> so a lot of tanks were not full. And I saw some concrete tanks that were nearly, that had been nearly empty that had been basically splintered and all you could see was the, the mesh of the Rio um, left. You know, so those tanks had been destroyed as well. Um, but I think probably because they were empty, had they been full, I think the, the mass of the water inside would have actually helped protect them. Um, and that was also direct flame attack. <coughs> yes, I agree entirely, uh, Dick. I use plastic tanks only when they're typically using the fall of land underground or under the building and they're fully shielded, they're fully enclosed by well, typically masonry of one form or another. Yeah. Certainly the hierarchy then goes to colour bond tanks. They're reasonable as long as you keep them away from the most intense heat and fire. Uh, stainless steel, more expensive, is better again uh, in terms of taking a higher level of heat. Um, so again, they all have their purposes. It's just you need to be cognizant of where they are physically in relationship to the property, the house, the fire direction. And as uh, Julie said, make sure they're accessible when they're really needed. Right. There's a question here about, um, it's not specifically bushfire related, but rather extreme heat. What role can local councils play but, uh, in encouraging climate resilient construction? For example, in New South Wales, councils have no powers to prevent dark roof material. And I think there would be a, a lot of other things that uh, we could do with, uh, with the planning rules and so on to, to be more climate resilient. Well, the good news is that building bushfire resilience is building climate resilience. And usually the added bonus is that the buildings are often more energy efficient because they have high performance in terms of achieving a building, a, a seal. Um, and draft control, and um, particularly glazing is often a higher spec. So, you know, that's the advice I always, always give to people is actually building to bushfire resilience is what we should be building to anyway. We live in this climate. Um, bushfire activity is increasing, so we need to respond to it. Um, part of how we respond to it is building to last. And that has the added benefit of, of designs which are low maintenance and durable and can you know respond to all kinds of climate events you know there's there's lots of climate events we need to be designing for and considering for when we're designing the building and when we're locating the building and site planning and that includes bushfire includes flood includes insect infestations you know extreme heat events all of those things and the, the good news is this is not a that's not an added extra the best thing from my perspective that AS3959 has delivered is that it mandates a site responsive design that no other planning code has ever made anyone do and say your block is not the same as your neighbours and that's from my perspective music to my ears <laughs> so I always say in a positive light this is good this is good design it's site responsive we need to look at what's happening on your site not on your neighbour's site. Right. And I say that in some jurisdictions, increasing number, they're not actually permitting new development past BAL 29. So mm. different states, different territories, different requirements, but there is obviously in the last 15, 18 months, a newfound awareness of what it all means. Climate mm. change, um, leading to bushfires, floods, uh, storm, etc. cetera. Sure. I think also there's a, there's a bit of a trend uh, towards resilience it's it's broad and it is therefore slow moving but the uh, australian sustainable built environment council asbec uh, has published certain documents in the last couple of years that have broad industry support saying to government this is how to do it this is this is where you need to be and this is how to get there um, but so uh, it's improving but perhaps not quickly enough mm. 
I must say that coming from Canada, it has been um, quite a journey for me trying to understand the lack of insulation from both heat and cold that the houses <laughs> have here. Welcome to Australia. <laughs> uh, and leaving, leaving uh, hot water tanks outside. I mean, that just <laughs> boggles the mind still many years later. Um, there's a there's something. Oh yes, decks were mentioned a couple of times in the in your presentations. Uh, Mark asks, what are what fire resistant materials should be used for decks? Uh, there's an assumption there that decks um, have a place in in fire resistant buildings. Well, I can Do say for the um, the one that we retrofit, that was actually a fiber cement deck, so a hardy deck um, mm -hmm. that is rated very high and has the added benefit of um, being quite a good sealed non-combustible system. Um, the main reason in Western Australia we have challenges is that lots of those um, bushfire resistant timbers that are included in the appendices of AS3959 aren't readily available here. So it's very Eastern centric in its timber species. So um, <laughs> we often have not a lot of choice about, you know, we can't just go and get some iron bark or some turpentine. Um, we've got jarra and we've got merbau and we've got pine <laughs> and that's it. And um, so, you know, a lot of those, uh, those issues mean that we have to look at those other options. And, you know, the other thing is not everyone, you know, you can still create outdoor areas that aren't decked. You can still use paving and, and other hard materials um, to create quality outdoor spaces, which is also what we encourage clients to look at um, because decks can be vulnerable for the, the gaps, the subfloor and, and all of those other reasons, um, you know, that I think those previous examples demonstrated of, of how, you know, integral they can be to the performance of the building. Um, Julie, please don't secede. <laughs> I think Western Australia already tried that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I only went down by one vote too um, <laughs> in the parliament. But um, the, the other material uh, of, in the FC kind of family of materials is magnesium oxide, which mm. uh, is highly fire resistant. And uh, what I would counsel against, I guess, is the the, the decking types that are heavily plasticized the yeah. uh, the kind of um i don't want to you know name names but um, know yeah um th they all have their limits in terms of their bell rating anyway but they also have some other issues in extreme heat mm -hmm. uh, not the least of which is that they themselves get extremely hot dangerously hot for bare feet especially in um, toddlers and crawling babies um, the one exception is one that's made with rice husks um, has a lot less plastic in it, a lot more rice and uh, resists heat, but it even so it still has a, a limit. I th it might be Bell 29. Um, so it can't be used in the high ratings. Mm. Mm. Can I say that I no longer use timber bearers and joists anywhere, mm -hmm. um, anywhere externally. I always use one of those folded metal products uh, just for longevity, um, for bigger spans. Yes, I will, if it's low bow, I will use a good naturally durable hardwood. Um, there's some good ones around. Certainly I won't use Merbau, imported usually <laughs> illegally running forest timber. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, yes, I have actually used some of those plasticized materials or yes, on certainly by the time you get to flame zone, if it's an elevated deck, we really have the Hardy's product is one of the only ones that I know of that's mm -hmm. available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left for um, maybe final comments from each of you before I go to a closing for the webinar. So any any final, we, we haven't got, there's still some questions and I think that uh, you, you may be able to, um, well, well, we'll see that generally the areas have been covered uh, by someone. So um, final thoughts on on um, anything to do, any left, unleft, no, unmet <laughs> uh, ideas that you want to share? Um, I could, the only thing I'd like to say, I guess, is that um, from my perspective, I think people need to remember that um, bush, building for bushfire resilience requires you to be active. So you need to be actively thinking through your site planning and your house location. You need to be actively thinking about 
the materials that you choose and, and your ability to maintain them. And you need to be actively thinking about how you're going to continue to mitigate your bushfire risks in your site um, with either your asset protection zone and, you know, in increasingly we're having to look further and further afield. But it's similar to when we're doing passive solar, which is that for you to live in a passive solar house, you have to be quite active. So for you to live in a bushfire resilient house, you also have to be quite active. Um, and I'd, the area I'd like to see more support for the average person and the consumers generally um, is, is more available information on how they can do that within their means. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be expensive. That example I showed you was a really affordable solution. It's not fancy. We're not going to win any architecture awards for our, our retrofit of that old shack. But what it's intended to demonstrate is that it's accessible and we need to make the information more accessible um, and reliable for consumers so that they don't waste money on the wrong thing um, and, and have that holistic approach to the site and, and the broader bushfire hazards right back to the house. Right. So uh, we have a responsibility for where we live. What, that's what if we I'm want doing. to live in the bush, this is what we're going to have to do. <laughs> yeah. Dick, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, no, I absolutely support what Julie said. And, and uh, um, actually, it was one of the things I really liked about that job you showcased was the, the fact that it, it, it maintains the humility of the original shack, mm -hmm. which is entirely lovable. Yeah. Um, so yeah, look, it, it just um, the only thing I want to add is that I uh, I stuffed up an answer on the Q and A, and I I made a question go away before I answered it. Um, uh -oh. So if somebody's out there feeling a bit miffed, type your answer again, and I'll have another crack at it. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Nigel, any last words? Okay. As Judy said, think carefully about what you're doing and why you're doing it and get good advice. You need to know your BAL rating. Some councils might provide it. There are certainly um, trained people such as Julie who also can provide you the BAL rating, but that's a minimum. I really want to design to the minimum. I want almost all my choices, mm -hmm. materials, detailing. We want to do better. We need to do better. And as Julie said very elegantly, if we're designing well for bushfire, we're obviously getting a, a closed up house. We've got much greater potential for passive solar, for sustainability, all the other things that we want in a yeah. house. So, but do yeah. be careful of extra building costs. Uh, I've estimated in some cases, well, AAMI insurance reckoned you can spend up to a quarter of a million dollars extra on a project home cost if you're in flame zone, up to 250,000 more. Now, it's not that much more for the houses that Dick, Julie, or myself would design anyway, because we've no. got most of those things as a given. It is more expensive by the mm -hmm. time you get to Balforty and Flame Zone in construction costs, in degree of detailing by your architect, your draftsman, whoever, and then the necessity to follow through the certification, the approval on all the specialized materials once you get up to the very high bowels. It's extra effort, extra time to make it rewarding in a, a practical, personal sense. Great. Thank you all, Dick, Nigel, Julie, for your contributions tonight. That was fantastic. Thank you also to everyone participating. I think we got up to over 300 people on, online tonight. You've all made the evening most informative and enjoyable. I am now going to walk you through a reminder about an upcoming July event uh, and our schedule for the next four sessions. So in July, Renew is organizing a series of speed date, a sustainability expert event, and they'll be held as part of this project. These events will provide the, you with the opportunity to, uh, for people who are rebuilding to sit down with experts, designers and builders to discuss their plans one-on-one. -on -one. So this will be starting in July. Bookings for these events will open soon and people rebuild, rebuilding will be given preference. Uh, so that is happening in July, but next uh, tomorrow and next week, we have the schedule for, um, for four other. So we've, we've done uh, rebuild first steps and designing and building for bushfire and climate resilience. 
Tomorrow's, tomorrow night's webinar is materials and construction. We've talked about, a bit about that today. Uh, then next Tuesday from 6 till 7.30, home energy setups for bushfire zone and climate resilience. Um, on the 9th, Wednesday, water storage and fire resistant landscaping. And we had some questions about that today. And uh, finally, next Thursday, retrofitting for fi fire resistance. So the um, uh, come along tomorrow. I'll, I'll be here, same time, same place, six o'clock. Uh, and I hope uh, you will be able to, to be with us for all of the rest of the, the webinars as well. Um, thank you all again for attending. I hope we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, and our webinar, oh, it's 7.30. Our webinar will now close.